Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship on this holiday weekend. It's so good to see you all here today. My name is Scott Beard. I'm the lead pastor here at First United Methodist Church in Kirksville. And it's my pleasure to spend this time with you on every Sunday morning. And those of you that are online, that we spend this time focusing on our faith and our walk with Christ. Uh, every time I sit down in my seat over here, I see this window that says peace through Christ in Latin. And it just reminds me of how that true peace came to the world. Uh, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 It is a good and joyful thing to be worshiping together wherever we are this morning, online or in person. I suspect we might have some of you online worshiping at home or maybe in a park someplace. Wherever you are, we are grateful that you are here. I'm Reverend Jennifer Finley, our Momentum and Discipleship Pastor. A couple of notes as we begin worship. Our worship is guided by our bulletins, either what you received as you came in or the online bulletin. You'll find all of our responses in there. We also celebrate weekly communion. If you are not familiar with our worship service and all are invited to participate in that. And so if you are here in this space, later in the service, you'll receive um, a cup of juice and a gluten-free rice cracker. If you are at home, we invite you to have something prepared, food, great crapper, cracker or grapes, um, or a coffee, who knows? Um, that's a, a holy sacrament for some of us, at least. Um, we also invite you to take a look at your bulletins, to take a look at the announcements and the ways in which you might want to be involved in the life of this community of faith. Um, one big thing we have coming up, not this coming week, but the week after, is our mobile day camp um, for our elementary age kids. And we are incredibly excited that that is back with us um, after a few years absence. And so registration is still open for that. We have a great crew registered, but we'd love to to have more and so um, if you have kids that age or you know of kids that age or maybe your grandkids are visiting for that week we would love to have them join us you'll find registration info in your bulletin your online bulletin there's a link to register online but if you need help with that process because we know it can be a little tricky feel free to give the office a call or stop by and we can help make sure we get you registered for that as well. Um, and now as we begin worship, uh, Rick Fleshner has an announcement report from annual conference, which is a few weeks ago. Yep. Well, good morning, church. Uh, I'm Rick Fleshner. Uh, in addition to being the chair of your church's administrative board, I'm also one of the lay members to annual conference from this church. This is the first Sunday of the new appointment year, and so I can tell you that officially, Reverend Scott Beard, Reverend Jennifer Finley, and Reverend Lori Landon have all been reappointed to this church for this next year. We live on multiple calendar cycles, and it seems like a strange time to be starting a new year, but it is a lovely, beautiful, wonderful time to be starting a new year with you. And we're so happy to be here. It's a real pleasure and an honor to serve in this church. And so I thank Rick and all the support that we get from so many people throughout this congregation. And now as we begin worship, we do what we do each week. We light candles and we invite you wherever you are, if you're at home, to find a source of light, perhaps a candle, um, and to light a candle as we light these. We do this each week, reminding ourselves that the power of the Holy Spirit is already in our midst, that we are called together in all kinds of ways to worship together by the power of the Holy Spirit. If you would take your bulletin or your online bulletin and stand, if you would uh, like, here in the congregation or at home, we'll read together the call to worship responsibly. Wherever we have been this week, we are welcomed here. As we worship, we gather to see the face of God. We gather in hope and courage. We gather to see the face of God. We gather to hear stories of faith. We gather to see the face of God. Come, let us listen to stories of hope and courage. Come, let us see the face of God in each other. Come, let us worship together. 
If you remain standing and take your red hymnals, turn to number 117 or your online bulletin. Let's sing together, O oh God, our help in ages past. to remain standing as we join together in our affirmation of faith, joining our voices across time and space. We believe, we believe in, in God, God, creator of the world and all people, and in Jesus Christ incarnate among us, who died and rose again, and in the Holy Spirit present with us to guide, strengthen, and comfort. We rejoice in every sign of God's kingdom, in the upholding of human dignity and community, in every expression of love, justice, and reconciliation. Through the presence of the risen Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, we commit ourselves to the ways of Christ to take up the cross, to seek abundant life for all humanity, to struggle for peace with justice and freedom, to risk ourselves in faith, hope, and love, praying that God's kingdom may come. Amen. Amen. You may be seated if you are standing. As we prepare to go to the Lord in, in prayer, we light candles to remind us that the Holy Spirit is a part of all of our lives and all that we do, there to give us guidance and direction and comfort there to pray for us even when we can't come up with the words to pray ourselves. We lift up today some situations and concerns that we have for ourselves and our community and our country. We celebrate the gift of independence that we have politically through our country through the sacrifice of so many on this 4th of July weekend. But we also celebrate the fact that many people do not experience the freedom that they would like to experience or that was due to them by their creator. We lift up those who are struggling with illness and injury and loss. Particularly, we want to remember those who were affected by the train crash last week. We lift up a prayer that, uh, brought to us by Sue Limestall of those who are volunteering in that recovery effort, helping the families who have lost loved ones helping those who have loved ones in the hospital. We know that other local community people are part of that effort as well. It hits so close to home, especially after our youth had just traveled on the train the week before. We remember those who are struggling with decisions made by the, the uh, Supreme Court and the government 
We know that these things are challenging and difficult and oftentimes difficult to understand. We pray for those who are affected by so many different things in our society, illness and injury, loss. We lift up Patty Harlow to you as she struggles with ALS. We know there are many others in our community that are struggling with other illnesses and other diseases, other problems in their lives, some of them physical and some of them spiritual and emotional. And we lift up our own lives to you, Lord, because we know that God wants the best for us. God wants us to have long and healthy lives, and it doesn't always happen that way. So we pray for peace and healing and comfort and joy. Will you join me in prayer? Almighty and everlasting God, we come to you humbly, seeking your guidance and peace in our lives. Lord, we thank you and praise you for this opportunity we have to live in this community, in this country, and the church and the family and the friends that we have. They give us support and comfort and peace each day. Lord, guide us in our decisions and the things that we do that truly seek justice for all people, relief from oppression, comfort and healing for those in need, and peace for all. Lord, we thank you for the, the weather that we have that's beautiful and we need to count these beautiful days. We need to remember how truly blessed we are that we have the things and that we truly need in this world, acknowledging that there are those who do not, that do not have the comforts and the resources that we have the opportunity to have. Lord, help us to be the people you call us to be, people that look, that truly notice those who are oppressed, that truly notice injustice in the world, that truly recognize the need to lift each other up, to give each other a helping hand, to remind ourselves that we are loved and that we and all others are made in the image of God. If we recognize that beauty and that reflection of your face in each and every person we see, I truly believe we can be comforted and encouraged as we go into the future, knowing that we do not walk alone, but that your Holy Spirit goes with us each and every step of the way. And for that we give thanks. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. We're going to continue in worship with a prayer. It's actually a song that is a prayer. It's from the Black Hymnal number 2157. You may remain seated as we sing three times through, Come and Fill Our Hearts. 2157 in the Black Hymnal. Come and fill our hearts with your peace. You alone, O oh Lord, are holy. Come and fill our hearts with your peace. Alleluia. Come and fill our hearts with your peace. You alone, O oh Lord, are holy. Come and fill our hearts with your peace. Alleluia. Come and fill our hearts with your peace. You alone, O oh Lord, are holy. Come and fill our hearts with your peace. Alleluia. Amen. This morning we are continuing in a summer worship series focused on the faces of faith, where we're looking at the diversity of the ways in which we interact with God, the diversity of the ways in which faith is expressed in our own lives, in our community around us, and in our scriptures. We are looking around us to ask where and how do we see faces of faith all around us, in our pews, in our homes, 
in our scriptures. Last week we heard from our, well, two weeks ago, we heard the story of Juneteenth and those modern day faces of faith. And last week we heard from our youth as they shared from their journey to Boston where they saw the face of God in others. And this week, this week we are returning to the faces of faith we find in some of our lesser known scripture stories. And this week we find ourselves in the book of Numbers. Now I'll confess that even your pastors, your clergy, probably are some of the ones, along with you guys, um, that skip over that part of the Hebrew scriptures, that part of the Old Testament, for it begins with a census of the Hebrew people. That's where the name Numbers comes from in the English. However, the Hebrew title for this book and the first word of the book itself actually can be translated as wilderness. For it's the stories of the wilderness times of the Hebrew people, stories from their time in the wilderness between their passage through the Red Sea and their exodus out of Egypt and their entry into the promised land. It's some 40 years. It's plenty of time for generations to have passed. It's stories of these people building their nomadic community life together, stories of their successes and their failures, their rebellion against God, and their return to God, their lack of trust in God's provision and their returning to trust in God. It's a story of people on the move. And within it, embedded in it, are some absolutely beautiful individuals and stories that we often miss as we skip over numbers. And so today, we invite you to hear the scripture and invite you to wonder how it might reveal faces of faith to us today. The scripture lesson comes from the book of Numbers, chapter 27, starting with verse 1. Then the daughters of Zelophehad came forward. Zelophehad was son of Hepher, son of Gilead, son of Machar, son of Manasseh, and the clans of Manasseh, son of Joseph. The names of his daughters were Mala, Noah, Hagla, Milcah, and Terzah. They stood before Moses, Eleazar the priest, the leaders, and all the congregation at the entrance of the tent of meeting, saying, Our father died in the wilderness. He was not among the congregation of those who gathered themselves against the Lord in the congregation of Korab, Korah, but died for his own sin, and he had no sons. Why should the name of our father be taken from this clan? Because he had no son. Give to us a possession among our father's brothers." Moses brought their case before the Lord. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, The daughters of Zelophehad are right in what they are saying. You shall indeed let them possess an inheritance among their father's brothers and pass the inheritance of their fathers on to them. You shall also speak to the Israelites, saying, If a man dies and has no son, then you shall pass his inheritance on to his daughter. If he has no daughter, then you shall give his inheritance to his brothers. And if he has no brothers, then you shall give his inheritance to his father's brothers. And if his father has no brothers, then you shall give his inheritance to the nearest kinsman of his clan, and he shall possess it. It shall be for the Israelites a statute and ordinance as the Lord commanded Moses. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Amen. Amen. Five young women stand together. We know their names. We don't often know their names in scripture. We know these names, and even though they're hard to pronounce, I think it's important to say them. Mala and My Noah. apologies to the Hebrew yeah, scholars that might saying. be here today. We thumb wrestled to see who was gonna read that scripture, right? <laughs> um, but we know their names. Mala, Noah, Hagla, Milka, and Tirzah. They stand in front of their gathered community as the role of those living in the community had just in the chapter before been read again as a new census, as a new census had just been taken. Their father had died as part of the generation that passed away in the wilderness and they had no brothers. They stand at the entrance to the tent of meeting, in other words, at the entrance to the place of worship, the center of community life. They stand in front of Moses and the chief priests of their community. They stand in a space that was most often dominated by male voices. They stand as women 
With men looking at them, they stand as women in a patriarchal inheritance system, and they made a bold request. Why should our father's name be withdrawn from the midst of his clan because he had no son? Give us a holding in the midst of our father's brothers. And I wonder if their voices trembled. I wonder if their hands shook or if they held hands. We don't know. I wonder if they looked at each other or straight ahead or into the eyes of the gathered community or into the eyes of Moses. Now, with our modern ears, we might simply hear this as a request for their inheritance, much like we might do in some type of legal proceeding today as a family distributes wealth after a death. But as one writer I read this week has written, this wasn't a legal proceeding, but an impassioned plea for justice. You see, these five women were making a bold request. First, that their father's name not be lost to the generations. I think many of us can understand that desire. They were also requesting that they themselves be included in the, in the inheritance of the land. You see, as the people prepared to leave the wilderness times and enter into the promised land, they prepared to apportion the new land that they had yet to inhabit based on tribe and clan. And the land was a sign to them of God's faithfulness, of God's promise from the beginning. So these sisters were asking to be fully included in the promise to God's people, to be fully included in the sign of the covenant. They weren't simply asking for themselves, they were also asking for the name of their clan not to disappear. They were asking for a change to the rules of their community life, their way of doing community things, not just for themselves, but for others. And so they stood at the entrance to the place of worship, and they made their plea for justice. And I wonder what courage that took. I wonder what faith that took. Faith in themselves, individually, and as a group. Faith in their community for the capacity to listen and to change. Faith in God. We know their names because they stood together and made their request. And of course, their faith and their courage is only a part of this story. If we look at this story and we see who the characters are, it's interesting to, to start to imagine in your minds what they were like. And I'm not sure that Moses looked like Charlton Heston in the Ten Commandments. <laughs> I don't think that actually fits, but, but, but it's easy to go there, right? Because we're so influenced by popular culture. We get this idea of what, what Moses must have been like. And, and sometimes it's easy to get the, the Old Testament characters mixed up with each other. So it's easy to get the details of their lives uh, kind of converged to, together. But you know, this is the story of Moses who was really a reluctant leader, right? Moses was not one that wanted to step out and be in charge of all these things. Moses was called by God. This is the same Moses we remember as a baby who there had been an edict from the Pharaoh that all the babies of the Jewish people were to be killed and, and remember Moses' mother puts Moses in a basket and sets him adrift in the in the stream near where the Pharaoh's daughter is bathing. And he's rescued. And he's raised as an adopted son of Egypt and comes into quite a lot of influence in Egypt. Here he's a Jewish baby raised in the Pharaoh's house. We know and we remember the story about how Moses saw the, uh, the beating of a Jewish slave and he gets so angry and incensed, he, he kills the slave master and hides the body. And then he has to run for his life. And then we see the story about how Moses has become a shepherd for his father-in-law Jethro's sheep. And Moses is content to live a quiet life as a shepherd. And yet God appears to him in the burning bush. And says, Moses... Take off your sandals because you're walking on holy ground. And then God tells Moses of his call to lead the people out of captivity in Egypt. Not probably on Moses' life plan. Probably not. But it was God's plan for Moses. 
So then Moses, with the help of God, gets the people to be uh, released from Egypt at the Pharaoh's, uh, the, <laughs> not the Pharaoh's desire, right? It was not what he wanted to have happen. But Moses then leads the people for 40 years in the wilderness. Moses looks like a Charlton Heston hero, but he, and yet he said he couldn't even speak to the people. And God said, well, your brother Aaron's going along and he speaks very well, so we'll have Aaron speak for you. But you're my guy. You're the one. In fact, Moses is so integral to this that when God gave Moses the commandments, we often refer to those commandments as Mosaic law. Law that came through Moses, from God through Moses to the people of Israel and to us. So why would the people of Israel get the opportunity to leave Egypt? Because God never forgot his people. But Moses didn't feel like he was up to this challenge. He didn't even know why they would listen to him. Why would they even pay any attention to this person that they saw as an Egyptian, even though he had been raised by his mother in the Pharaoh's uh, daughter's house? So Moses, with the help of his brother, had led the people, led them for many years, and many times, as Reverend Jennifer already pointed out, many times they turned their back on Moses. Many times they resisted what God wanted them to do. Many times they grumbled about manna. It's manna every day. What's for breakfast? Manna. What's for dinner? Manna. What's for lunch? Manna, right? They had manna all the time, except when God said, okay, I'll send you meat, and then that rotted in their mouths, and so that wasn't really a good choice either, right? The people were grumbling. Not that we ever grumble, but we might do that same thing, right, when God's giving us good gifts. But it was during that period of time, during that wandering in the wilderness, that the people became a people, became a nation. And the tribes started delineating themselves, and the clans became more defined. And that's where we're seeing this story today, where they're taking the second census of the people, because this has been many years. And the, the tribes have grown, and there are many people involved with this. So in today's story, when the daughters of Zelophehad, aren't you glad you're not the liturgist today? <laughs> she made me read it. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. But the daughters of Zelophehad knew that this wasn't right. They knew they couldn't stand by and allow their father's name to go away because they could not inherit the land. Why should the name of our father be taken away from his clan? Because he had no son. Why should that happen? You know, the law provided guidance on the inheritance of land. You know, it went to the oldest son, and, and then there was a sequence of people after that as, uh, as is modified later. But, but if there are no sons, then do the, do the daughters of the family count for nothing? Should they not be considered? They're pleading their case, as was pointed out earlier, for their own future, as well as the future of their family. They weren't only thinking about, I want my part of the inheritance. It's not like they want a certain amount of money to go spend somewhere. They're looking for the land because they're defined, their clan is defined by the land that they possess, the land of their ancestors, that they then could pass on to those beyond them. It was essential for the existence of their family. But the patriarchal system, as it pointed out, the, the patriarchal system overlooked the women and often didn't even count them. In fact, as was Reverend Jennifer pointed out, most of the women in the Bible aren't even named. They say, well, the wife of, or the, or the woman said, and I know that it's hard to understand, but that's the system that they were living in. And women were expected to get married and they became part of a new clan and their name was gone, really gone forever because they were now part of a new clan so Moses had a choice. Moses had a choice. He could have told those women of, of this family, he says, you know, the, you know what the law is. I'm sorry, but that's just the way it is. Moses could have done that. But the scripture says Moses took it to the Lord. Now Moses didn't have anything to gain by this, did he? Moses could have easily been struck down or something or rebuked by the Lord if he, by bringing this request to God, Moses also had not a whole lot to lose because Moses had already been told by God that he was not going to ever see the promised land. I don't know if you remember that part of the story. But he's already been told by God, 
Because of Moses' disobedience at one point in the journey, um, God says, you will die before you get into the promised land. So here he spends so much of his life leading the people, and yet he already knows that his successor, Joshua, in fact, in the very next chapter, or the, actually the end of this chapter in the book of Numbers, um, Moses then calls jo Joshua to be his successor. And so this is something that Moses is taking some risk, but he's also saying he's rising to the occasion because he could have easily walked away. He brought it to the God and he says, he brought this case and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, as the scripture says, the daughters of Zelophehad are right. This is God speaking in what they are saying. You shall indeed let them possess an inheritance among their father's brothers and pass the inheritance of their father on to them. God recognized an unjust situation within the law. Now this doesn't mean that God made a mistake, but God was realizes when the women pointed out this particular situation is such an, and situations like this need to be addressed in a different way. We cannot apply the same law to all people and have it be fair to all people. So God said to, to Moses, you know, if he has no brothers, then you shall give it to the inheritance to his father's brothers. And, and so it doesn't stay with the women the whole time, right? So this isn't like complete... Um, Women's liberation all in one text. I mean, it, it doesn't all happen just because of this one particular story. But, but God recognizes the fact that the women were important. And they must can be able to continue the legacy of their family. And then uh, God ends it with, it shall be an ordinance. Um, it shall be for the Israelites a statute and an ordinance. And as he commanded this to Moses. God made sure that the women were treated with justice and equity. God made sure that even though the law, we think of the law sometimes as being static, but the law is always being interpreted. And even God reinterpreted the law to say, they're right. They need to inherit the land. And so we know their names. Mala, Noah, Hokla, Milkla, Tirzah, Eleazar, and Moses. We know the names in this story. What do we do with their witness to us? How are they faces of faith for us today? You might have your own answer to that as you've heard these stories. And perhaps if this is the first time you've heard this story, it might take a while to wonder together about how these are witnesses to us today. As I've thought about that for myself this week, I found it tempting to pick either the women or Moses as my face of faith, my example to follow, but I realize that they all are. They all are. Earlier this week, I was reading some things online and I had a friend post a clergy colleague and friend in ministry, and she was talking about how she spent most of her career, she's about my age, that's not a huge amount of time, but long enough to have gained some experience. Um, she talked about how she spent most of her career lifting up the voices of others and advocating for others. And that's good and holy work. And then she also mentioned that somehow that had also blinded her to the fact that she herself was sometimes the recipient of unjust systems and that she hadn't really ever included herself in a space to speak up for herself. And she was speaking particularly about the, the, the role of being a female clergy person and the ways in which that sometimes that put her in unjust positions and also how it often put her in positions to listen and amplify the voices of others. And as I read that story and I heard it in conversation with this story and with my own stories, I realized there's a temptation to say either, either we're speaking up for injustice on our own behalf or we're listening to the stories of others. But what if, what if these are examples of faith for all of us? What if we can hold these two things together? Speaking up for ourselves when we recognize that we are impacted by unjust systems, systems of oppression. And also 
recognizing that most of us are also part of systems that oppress others. What if we can hold those two things together? That role of advocating for ourselves and also doing what Moses did, letting go of his grasp on power, letting go of the need to have it all figured out, letting go of the need to have the voice that resounds, or the image of being in control, setting that aside to bring and amplify the voices of others and their needs. Faces of faith, I kept thinking I had to choose, but I wonder if it's both and. When I consider this topic of faces of faith, certainly you can see it in Moses, right? That Moses was not, did not feel adequate to do the job he was called to do. And yet he did. He responded to God's command. And in many cases, he pled the case of the people of Israel. When God was ready to smite them all, he said, no, give me another chance and I will help them. So Moses certainly was a face of faith, and the daughter of Zelophehad, I mean, they had to look out not only for themselves, as, but, but for all of their clan and all of their tribe. They were standing up for what was right. And I see the faces of faith in each of you. I see the faces of faith of people who want the right thing to be done, who want justice in this world, who want to stand up for those who are oppressed, who realize we cannot have society that treats people differently based on their gender or, or, or their race or their social economic condition. And you can name any oppressed group you want to and you know that we have to stand up for them. As, amen. As Christians, we don't have a choice but to stand up for those who are least, those who have the least amount of power, those who cannot get through this life without people around them, gathering around them, giving them support. So I see the face of faith in each of you. I see Christ shining through you. I see that you can make a difference in your community and ultimately for the transformation of the world, which is our mission, that we are to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world that others will see that each and every person is made in the image of God, that each and every one of us have sacred worth, that each and every one of us, no matter, should be treated with equity. I remember in my lifetime that much of this has changed. It wasn't that many years ago when women couldn't vote or couldn't get a charge card. And some of you experienced some of these things in your life. And you know it has to change. It has to be treated in such a way that we respect one another as God-given people. That we stand up and become that face of faith for the world. That others will know that we care and we love for each other. We try and love each other the way Christ loved us. And I think that's the goal. That's what it means for Christian perfection. That we respond to one another the way Christ does, showing love and grace and respect. And I think the Holy Communion table is one of the best examples we have of this because everyone is invited to this Holy Communion. Everyone is invited to the sacred moment with Christ. Everyone is included. It makes no difference if you're a member of this church or a member uh, of, of any uh, particular church or, or if you're Methodist or not it makes no difference because Christ came so that all might live amen mm. Christ came that all might have life abundantly Christ came that all might experience God's love through his son Jesus Christ and as we prepare to come forward we know that we haven't always lived up to the way that we would that God would have us to live that we haven't always Looks, I haven't always sought justice and peace and reconciliation. And so we have a prayer of confession that helps focus our minds on this. And you'll find this on the screen or in your on, uh, bulletin or online bulletin. Let's read this together. O Lord, Lord speak, speak to our, our hearts that, that we may see and acknowledge our own needs. needs. Open, Open our, our eyes that we, we may see the needs of others. others. 
open our ears that we may hear their cries. Let us not be afraid to defend the weak because of the anger of the strong, nor afraid to defend the poor because of the anger of the rich. Open our hearts to where love and hope and faith are needed, that we may do the work of peace and justice in your name. Amen. amen. And amen. And as we have asked God for help, we can also, as forgiven and reconciled folks who are going on to perfection, we can indeed greet each other with the peace of Christ. And we invite you to do that, either in the comments or here in the space to show signs of peace to each other. The peace of Christ be with you. And also, also with, with you. you. Peace of peace Christ, Christ be, be with, with you. you. So on that night that Jesus was betrayed, that he met in the upper room with his disciples to celebrate the Passover, to celebrate how God had always been with him, uh, particularly through these 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, but each and every day from the beginning of time until today, that God has been there, that God continues to show us grace, that this idea that God allowed the people of Israel to be released from captivity and delivered to the promised land. So it was during that Passover celebration that Jesus took off his outer garment, he got down and he washed the feet of his disciples to show them how much he loved them and to also show them what it meant to be a servant leader. To lead, you must be willing to serve. As Moses was called to lead the people, he had to humble himself to be the servant of God, to do the things that God would have him to do. And Jesus also said, I give you a new commandment. And this is the one that I think we need to look to how, to, how can we practice this more fully in our lives today, to love one another as I have loved you, treating all people with sacred worth, showing all people that God loves them, and we do too. It was during that meal that Jesus picked up some of the bread, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. And similarly, he took the cup. He said, this is the blood of the new covenant. This is the new promise poured out for you and for many for the remission of sins. Whenever you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, do so in remembrance of me. And so as Christ first lifted that bread so long ago, we lift ours today. Trusting in the power of the Holy Spirit to bring us together as one body. As Christ lifted the cup Many years ago, we lift our individual cups today, representing the fact that the Holy Spirit can draw all of our hearts and minds and souls together, uniting us in love and grace and peace. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray that you pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread or crackers and juice or whatever is assembled on the altars of those who are worshiping with us online. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit inhabit these elements, that when we receive them into ourselves, we receive the Spirit of Jesus Christ, and that we know that when we go forth from this place, we will have the strength and courage to do the things we're called to do, to stand up before others of power, and to speak truth, and to speak towards justice, and to relieving of oppression through every means that we can. Lord, let us be these beacons of light and hope and peace to the world. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And now we pause briefly to bless our meal together with one voice. We invite you into these words of the Lord's Prayer together. Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. amen and amen. And now we feast together for those who are worshiping online. We invite you to partake now as you hear these words. The body of Christ broken for you. Amen. blood of Christ shed for you. The body of Christ given for you. 
Amen. And the blood of Christ shed for you. Praise God. table is set. We invite you to come at the direction of the ushers. For those online, we hope and pray this is a time of meditation and prayer.
Amen. As we return and prepare to conclude worship with singing and dispersing once again, we invite you into this prayer of thanks. Eternal, Eternal God, God, we, we give, give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us, one body, body gathered in you. Grant, grant that we may go into our days in the strength of your spirit to give, give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, Christ our Lord, amen. If you would take your hymnals, it's the red hymnal, turn to 100. Let's stand and sing together. God, whose love is reigning over us. God, whose love is reigning over us, source of all the ending truth. Streams like children singing, ocean waves like thunderbolt. Alleluia, alleluia, as creation's tale is told. Holy God of ancient glory, choosing man and woman to Abram's faith and Sarah. Story formed a people bound to you. Alleluia, alleluia, to your covenant thus true. Covenant new again in Jesus, star child born to set us free, sent to heal us, sent to teach us. How love's children we might be. Alleluia, alleluia, risen Christ our Savior He. Lift we then our human voices in the songs that faith would bring. Live within in human choices lives that like our music sing. Alleluia, alleluia, joined in love our praises ring. Friends, we disperse once again. Perhaps it is to advocate for justice on our own behalf. Perhaps it is to listen to the stories of others. Know that whether our hands are shaking or our feet are shaking or our voices are trembling, we go in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. We are standing on holy ground, and I know that there are angels friend. 